<laughs> right, okay. We're back. This is the last part of our generous series. So we've done generous with your words, we've done generous with your time, and now we're talking about are you generous with your stuff. Okay, our foundational verse for it all. You're right over there. Yeah, it's Proverbs 11, <laughs> verse 25. Okay, I'll read it out to us again. It says, A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Meaning, that if you're a generous kind of person, then you will be blessed yourself. Yeah, you will prosper. Might not always mean that you'll prosper with like money or you know material things, but you will prosper. You'll be successful in your life. A man that refreshes others, or woman, that refreshes others, will himself be refreshed. Right, just to be a bit PC. <laughs> so meaning, again, exactly the same thing. If you're the kind of person that goes around encouraging people, lifting people up, helping people out, you know, in, in whichever format, all right, with your words, with your time, with your stuff, you will then, in your time of need, you will then find yourself being refreshed in a likewise manner. Okay? It's just one of God's principles on earth that applies I think to everybody on the planet, whether you're a believer or not, actually, I think it's just one of those principles of God's grace that he's put into motion on the earth. That generous people, when, you know, tribal or, or strife comes their way, find themselves, you know, being recipients of other people's generosity in those times. Like the principle of sowing and reaping. Those that sow good, reap good. Those that sow bad, reap bad. It's just one of God's principles. Okay. So, are you happy with your stuff? With the stuff that you've got? Or do you want more stuff? Do you all know what I mean when I'm talking about stuff? Yeah? Talking about things that you can touch, feel, material possessions. Wealth, money, you know... Chocolate. Chocolate, clothes, <laughs> anything that you can see, feel, touch. That's what I'm kind of talking about when I'm talking about your stuff. Yeah? Stuff that you can hold in your hand. Because words you can't hold in your hand. And time you can't hold in your hand unless you've got a watch. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, you know what I mean? They're kind of intangible things. Yeah. But your stuff is the tangible. Yeah? The stuff that you can feel and touch. So... Are you happy with your stuff? Or do you want more stuff? Are there things that you want? So, how do adverts make you see things? How do adverts make you see your stuff? I'm going to put on a couple of adverts. So if you're hearing this, <laughs> tough, really? Just selection of apps. They're this easy to find and this easy to download right to your phone. So it can be almost anything, like a boarding pass. Or do almost anything, like pay for your coffee. Yep, if you don't have an iPhone, well, you don't have an iPhone. You're so rich. You don't have a life. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it either. The people there have no idea what we're watching. <laughs> yeah, unlucky brownies first. <laughs> I can't see it because it's all around my glasses. <laughs> 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 the dude in the car is like, one sec. <laughs> <laughs> it's that a GTA though, isn't it? <laughs> and it was Xbox. Is there another one on my backside of it? <laughs> Do you want to sit on that Set up properly. Uh, amazing car ad. Oh, advert. Oh, this is a bit awkward. <laughs> 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 
Oh, I'm so 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 I
You can go to you can go to most houses, right, and find something in someone's house that you've got in your own house. Yeah? Years and years ago, if someone had been to Asia or whatever and got some really nice artifacts or, or articles of, of furniture, no one else would have that. That would be a completely unique piece of furniture or whatever. But nowadays with shops like Habitat and you know things like that, you go there, you can all have exactly the same in your homes. And what that makes people do is they go to someone's home, they're like, oh, that's nice. I can get one of them. So they get one of them thinking that that will make their home a higher standard to the other person's home that they like much better than their own home. There's no contentment with your stuff anymore. Okay, so we all know as well, all right, that because of this, if you don't have that certain stuff, whatever it is, gadgets, clothes, things, then you're cast out of certain social groups, yeah? It happens to all of us. If you don't have it, you can't be part of that crowd over there. You've got to make your own little kind of clique and crowd over here because that's the kind of clique and crowd that you're a part of because of the stuff that you have. It becomes part of your identity, part of what you have, the clothes that you wear, the way that you dress, the makeup that you put on, the jewellery that you have. I mean, you know, you can go around wearing dog collars and all black leather stuff and, you know, you'll never fit in with, with most groups, all right? But you'll have your own little group where other people won't fit in because, you know, your stuff ain't the same. Okay, so we can be social outcasts because of the stuff that we do or don't have. Agreed? Okay, so what we find in the Bible is that the authors of the Bible have been inspired by God. Try and teach us differently. Try and teach us how to really view our stuff. So not view it as everyone sees their stuff, but view your stuff through the lens of scripture, if you can, okay? So, what do some of the writers of the Bible say? They say not to covet others' possessions. One of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 17 says that we cannot serve both God and a lot of translations will say money, others will say wealth. In Matthew 6 verse 24, you cannot serve both God and wealth. It says that we should give to the poor. Parable of the rich fool, for example. Luke 18 verse 22. And it also encourages us to share what we do have. We see that in Passages like Acts 4 verse 32. As we see with the rich ruler, okay, let's go there and read it out. So if you've got your Bible with you, or if you've got your app open, you can all turn there. Luke 18 verse 18. Luke 18 through to 23. First person to get there, shout. Luke, what? You wake it's up. It's going to sound great. Luke, what? 18. Right? Luke, 18. 18, verse 18. Yeah, I've got it. Okay. So, a certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was a man of great wealth. Okay. What you say? What was Luke? That one. 18, yeah. Verse 18 through to 23. Alright. As we see with that passage, the rich guy who had a lot of stuff, had a lot of trouble thinking he had to give up his stuff. It's an indicator of his heart. Really... 
your stuff it doesn't form your identity. It doesn't, you know, give you such status or anything like that. The way you view your stuff is actually more of an indicator of your heart than your position. Oh, yeah. Right? The way that you see your stuff lets you know whether really you, you, you desire your stuff, your things, more than what you desire true riches in heaven. Last week we talked about your time and investing your time in people. And again, are people more important than your stuff? Or is stuff more important than the people around you? Where's your heart? But also remember that the heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart will try and tell you that your stuff is important. Your heart will try and justify your stuff to you, saying that you've got to have this, otherwise you won't be able to reach these kind of people. You won't be able to talk to those kind of people. You've got to have this kind of stuff, otherwise you will be that social outcast. And you won't be able to affect people's lives in such a positive and brilliant way. Just bear that in mind when you're considering how you do your stuff. The rich young ruler had issues, as we also saw that in, in Matthew 6, verse 24, we cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus himself said that you cannot serve both God and money, or God and wealth, for a better translation. Either you serve the one and you despise the other, or the other way round. Yeah, you cannot do both. You cannot live your life chasing after status and accumulating nice things for you, for your home, for your family, for yourself. Okay. You you, you can't build your home like that and, and and build God's kingdom at the same time. You either work with the motive of building God's kingdom, or you work with the motive of building your own kingdom, building your own home. Now don't get me wrong, we've got lots of stuff here, yeah, in this house. Some of it, really, we could do without, truly. Some of it is necessary. Some things are necessary. I'm not talking about the necessary things in life, yeah. I'm really talking about the things that we want and desire but we don't need there is so much that we don't need I've got a bookshelf full of books there I'm the chief of hypocrites when it comes to this I say I want to keep some of those books because they'll be good for Isaac when he gets older mm. read some of the classic books he'll get some culture into his life it'll help with his English literature when he goes to school or maybe not <laughs> alright but you know, I do. I, I try and justify these things to myself. But every now and again I sit back and I think about it. I'm like, man, do we really? We made a decision this year, Ruth and I, to try and declutter our house. Okay, we've got a box full of to the roof trying to sell. No, it's, it's just, you know, for someone it's, it's good stuff. To us it's just to, it was cluttering up our house. But even that isn't truly generous. Ah, uh, okay. So, if we do allow wealth and possessions to rule our lives, if we do live our lives wanting to accumulate things for ourselves, that we might worship for some stuff, we might end up Okay, I've got some boxes and some bags, and we can get started, okay? Put it on big screen. For compulsive hoarder Karen, it's finally time to begin the difficult process of cleaning up. <laughs> with help from professional <laughs> organizer, Sarah Buckwalter. We're going to have a category for keep. Right. We're going to have a category for things we're going to charity. We'll sort of state of that. And one for things are... Right. She started off. Marvelous. Just getting a few bits, <coughs> them, so nice. And a few bits turn into a lot more bits, and then more and more and more, and you end up with a house full of stuff that you don't really want. 
There's a common phrase, there's a popular phrase that goes around. I've, I've heard it in church circles for a while now. But we buy stuff that we don't need to impress people we don't like with money we don't have. Mm -hmm. True, really, when you think about it. Yeah? Because the people that we do like, and that do like us, if they're really our mates, they're not bothered about what stuff you've got. Mm. They're your mates because they like you. They're not bothered about things that you keep or you have at home. If they are bothered about them things, maybe it's because they covet them things or they want them things for themselves and they hope that one day you might see it fit to give them these things or help them out with these things or, you know, affirm their lifestyle because you have those things. If you've got it in your house, then obviously if they get it in their house, you can say, nice, nice, yeah, look at that. Look at those curtains. They're, those curtains, like our curtains at home, nice curtains. Real friends would be more interested in you. And if you're a real friend, you'll be more interested in them as opposed to what they have. Okay, so that's a bit of an extreme example we just saw there, the extreme hoarders. Our lives get so full of junk, we don't even know what we have half the time. We've got cupboards. You have cupboards and stuff that you don't even know what's in your cupboards anymore. And then you go rooting through it one day and it brings back all these memories and you find it hard to get rid of this stuff. If, you, if your parents or someone's like, oh, we're going to do a boot sale, and you look through it and you're like, oh, I had that when I was 10. You're like, I remember that. It's an old transformer. And you're like, oh my goodness, what am I doing with an old transformer still? I can't get rid of it because it's such a part of me. <laughs> you didn't even know you had it till you went through your cupboards. You don't care about it. It's just brought back these memories. Yeah? This stuff that you don't want, it's cluttering up your life. Our aim and example as Christians, I really believe, is to be more of that of the first believers. The example is in uh, Acts chapter 4. Verse 32. Okay. I'll read it out. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. What they did back then, the book of Acts tells us that several people did this. The wealthy that had land went and sold their land and they put all the money into a pot. And if anyone was poor, couldn't afford to live, feed themselves or whatever, they'd be fed out of the pot. So that the rich weren't as rich, but their money was spread. And the poor weren't so poor because none of them were in lack anymore. None of them starved. Mm. Some people might go as far to say, well, that's just communism that the old Soviets and the Chinese used to run their countries. But truly, communism doesn't work. You know it doesn't work. That's why all those countries have reverted back from communism, because it didn't work. Alright? There's some good principles in it, admittedly. But God's way is the best one. God's way is the way that works. It's been proved through generations, for the last 4,000 years. People have stuck firm to these principles. Yeah? And it works. It does work. All this wisdom in this book, mate, you should read it sometimes. You'll find out there's some really cool stuff in there. So, I believe that that really is more of our example. Because, I'll tell you the because for it as well. Ultimately, everything that we have, everything that we've got in our hands, everything we can touch, all the time that we have, our ability to talk and speak, yeah, to be generous with our words, to be generous with our time, to be generous with our stuff. We can be generous with it, because it's all from God anyway. It was all given to us by God our good and gracious God that saw it fit to give us air to breathe and food to eat and drink to drink and land to walk on and gave us the ability and brains to 
make wealth and to bless others through our wealth. It all comes from God in the first place. And the second thing that I think in the case of we can be generous with this stuff is because like last week we saw that our life is just a blip in the face of eternity. It's a, it's a nothing when we think of eternity. And we can look forward to an eternity now with God. Because this life isn't very much. We could do so much more with our lives if we thought more about eternity than we did about right now. Because we can't take our stuff with us. We can accumulate all this stuff, have grand, nice big houses, you know, with diamante chandeliers and, you know, marble flooring and, you know, grand pianos and whatever, <laughs> right? We can have all that stuff. When we're dead, what happens to it? Our kids might have it. How do we know what our kids are going to do with it? They might gamble it all away or whatever. Who knows? don't know. Hopefully not, but it's happened countless times in the past, isn't it? So we can't take this stuff with us. Andy Stanley challenged me in one of his messages once. Okay. He said this. If you go out and buy something, when you buy it, if you see someone that has a greater need for it than you, are you able to let go of it? That should be a question that governs every purchase we make. Because if we can't let go of it, if we find it's too much because we want it so much, then is it, is it an idol in our lives? Is it something that we place above God? Yeah? If we're walking down the street, and we've just bought a nice hat. And we're all along like, yeah, well. <laughs> check out my hat, you know, with a bobble on the top or the tassels on the side, you're like, yeah. Keep your head warm. Look at me. But then you see some cold tramp beggar yeah. in a doorway with nothing, hasn't even got a blanket. Bold. You're just bold, yeah. Cold head. Yeah. Are you willing, <laughs> would you be willing to see that person be like, you need this more than me? Well, <laughs> <laughs> do I just look good wearing my hat? It's a challenging thought, isn't it? And that, that principle applies with everything. Mate, it could even go as far as getting a car. You can go out and buy a car, and then someone you know, yeah, desperately needs a car, because they need a car to get to work and back. And if they haven't got a car, then they haven't got a job. And if they haven't got a job, then they don't feed their family. If they don't feed their family, they're screwed. If you're getting a car, so you can get to church and back on a Sunday morning, that's about it. Yeah. It's a tough one. The small things are easy. The bigger the things become, the more of a challenge it is. Don't we all think so? Yeah? It's a tough challenge. Tough thing to be thinking about. So, we're going to end with this now. Alright. I want to encourage you guys. Go home. <laughs> and search your hearts. Search your hearts. Considering your stuff. Search your hearts about how to be generous with your stuff. Things that come into your hands, will you easily let it pass through your hands? We've all been the recipients of unexpected gifts. I'm almost certain of it. Someone at some time in our lives has blessed us with, might it be a small thing, like a CD or a book that's encouraged us. Might be bigger things, they might have blessed us with you know, a nice outfit. They might have blessed us with some cash in our hands when we needed it most. How did you feel when you received that? You felt good, right? You're like, mate, someone's just given me something for nothing. That's, that's good. That's a nice feeling. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. How did you think the person who gave you that thing felt when they gave you that thing? I bet they felt good too. Because they're like, okay, I'm going to help this person out. I'm going to bless this person in some way. Whether it's a small way or a large way. It doesn't matter. The principle's the same. You can be those that refresh others. And you will be refreshed yourself. Does all that make sense? Mm. Yeah? Shall we pray? And then we'll get down to some questions, yeah? 
So yeah, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with so much. You've given us air to breathe. You've given us drink to drink. You've given us food to eat. You've given us clothes on our back. You've given us shelter and warmth and love and kindness and compassion in our lives. We just pray, Father, that you help us to be those people that will go out there and be refreshers of others, that will be generous to others. I pray, Father, that you just help us to have a heart that is to bless, that is to be generous, not to do it grudgingly or out of a, out of a mean-hearted, I must do this religious kind of spirit, but out of a generous, I want to do this because it's a good thing to do and it will just bless that person and I just want to be a lover of people kind of spirit. I thank you, Father, so much for the word that you've given us that governs our lives, that gives us so many good principles and, and draws us closer to you, ultimately, Lord. Teach us about you. It's awesome. And I thank you for it. I just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, amen, Lord. What, what have we to give, Lord, that wasn't given, Lord? What have we to lose that we already ours, Lord Jesus? It's all yours, Lord, and, and you came to this world to, to live a perfect, sinful life, Lord, and, and all, that, all that happened, Lord, is you lost, Lord. You lost your life, Lord, but, and all you did is give, Lord. You, you, you came to this world and you gave your life, Lord. You gave your, your everything. You gave your time and, and you bowed with, to our feet, Lord, and, and you washed feet, Lord, and and you just gave, Lord, you just gave, Lord, to help us to have a heart like you, Lord, that, that will want to give, Lord, that will want to humble ourselves below the, the, our enemy, Lord, and below the people that we, may not, we, that we might not even like, Lord, and, and, and help us to just serve, Lord, and help us to, to have a heart that will, that will give up our, our, our time and our, our stuff, Lord, and, and everything that we have, Lord, to just see your kingdom come, Lord, and just be like you, Jesus, Lord.